Schönen guten Nachmittag zu diesem sechsten hessischen Livestream, Hessens Livestream, dem Livestream aus der hessischen Landesvertretung in dieser Corona-Zeit, in der wir alle nicht mehr ganz so daheim sitzen inzwischen, der manch ein oder andere schon im Büro ist und wieder anfängt zu arbeiten, in dem das Leben langsam zurückkehrt, in dem wir aber weiterhin auf Distanz sind und deswegen auch auf Distanz diskutieren. Heute spreche ich mit Oliver Pasch, dem Ministerpräsident Ostbelgiens. Ja, das ist es für die, die in Hessen sitzen und mit dem belgischen Konstrukt nicht ganz vertraut sind. Es gibt die Flamen, es gibt die Union, es gibt die deutschsprachige Gemeinschaft. Sollte man an dieser Stelle vielleicht gleich noch vorweg schieben. Oliver Pasch ist Ministerpräsident seit 2014, wenn ich es äh, richtig im Kopf habe. Und davor ähm, schon eine Zeit lang in der ostbelgischen Politik aktiv gewesen. Ich habe auch bei Banken gearbeitet, aber das liegt so weit zurück, dass es fast schon historisch ist. Ähm, es geht jetzt direkt zurück nach Wiesbaden an die Europaministerin, Frau Puttrich, die jetzt Minister zu begrüßen ist. Frau Puttrich, wo, uh, wo welcome you all. Herzlich willkommen, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, Hallo, liebe Gäste. Ich freue mich, dass Sie heute dabei sind. Wir haben der Situation in Belgien. Belgium has hard hit by the Corona crisis then for Germany related to the Netherlands, Belgium counts more victims. But Belgium can, too can now loosen the measures. I'm very happy that Hendrik Kapsack will ask the question, questions today and this will be another interesting meeting for you. Once again, Welcome to all of you, and if you want to ask questions to your, during the event, you will be able to do so thanks to a dedicated phone number that you will see on the screen. And should you be able to follow the whole event, you can see the registration later. I'm looking forward to see you soon in the Frau Puttrich hat darauf hingewiesen, Sie können... Ms. Puttrich, Puttrich oh. As mentioned, that you will be able to call in during the next 40 minutes that we still have in this live stream. So I'm just going to give you the number again if you're looking on the screen. It's 0032 for Belgium, 472-0301-81. Mr. Pasch, let's talk a little bit about Belgium, but not only about Belgium. We want to talk about Belgium. We want to talk about the European Union as a whole, how they're dealing with this crisis situation. And we are all trying to defend what the Commission is doing. But let's look at Belgium first, because Belgium is playing an important role in this Corona crisis as far as there have been more victims, 8,700 people have died from, this, uh, from the virus so far, rounding a little um, up to today. Is this a statistical effect for Belgium in a worse situation? Has it been worse prepared than other states? So Belgium is one of the states that reacted most quickly to the first infections and have taken drastic and strong measures immediately and has even limited its citizens' freedoms. And this has been lasting four, seven, eight weeks. So the difference from what has been Italy is I've uh, seen a conference by Trump that uh, this has been mentioned. Uh, what people wait about Belgian numbers. This is mostly statistically, statistics based. If you look at the numbers we publish, we have a lot more transparent than other states are. For example, any suspicious cases in care homes for the elderly that haven't been tested, but where there is a sufficient uh, suspicion due to systems that it might have been COVID, all of these are counted in the 8,700. And half of those are people where we don't have proof that they had COVID, but there was a suspicion of COVID-19. So if we want, would want to compare only confirmed proven cases, the death rate of, half of Belgium would go down by half. Additionally, 
we are currently in a calm sanitary situation on less than 45% uh, of the beds in hospitals are occupied, same, uh, even less than 30% for the ICU, contagion rate below 0 0.5, so we are about average in Europe. And so now we have a situation that allows us to ease up measures. So the situation, to state more clearly, from Spain and Italy, we have seen images uh, with uh, people lying uh, in beds in, in, uh, in the hallways in the hospitals. That's never happened, but you know that we've reached 55% of places occupied in the ICU. So we've always had available capacity in hospitals of about 45% capacity that was in reserve that we had free. We've never reached our limit, but we have a difficult situation at the beginning of March when new infections every day we had 600 new patients going to the hospitals and we've had been able to calculate how long it would take uh, until we would reach a situation such as in Italy and Spain. And if we hadn't taken drastic measures within three weeks, we would have been at the same level as Italy or Spain, which is why the masters taken were so strong. So you're a member of the National Security Council. So that is the institution that takes this kind of decision upon measures in uh, Belgium. So at the time, uh, like, and we can say at the time, even if it was only three or five weeks ago, though it was a very quick decision to take these drastic measures. There wasn't a lot of discussion about it, though there was a discussion at the very beginning about it. For example, how and when are the schools to be closed? Uh, you know that similar to Germany, uh, this is not a federal affair, this is a regional affair, so we had to find an agreement between three communities. Um, it's not always easy in a federal state, but it, 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 we find a way to work it. So the prime minister managed to unite the language communities in Belgium to have a coherent approach to this for the whole country. Uh, difficult aspects, uh, like in any other country, is the exit strategy, because we trying to organize and plan things that normally never have to be planned or organized. Many aspects of uh, general life in society have to be organized and planned in a way that normally don't happen. And we have no blueprints for this. We have never had to plan this before. So implementing exit measures makes it a lot harder than just taking a simple decision. Mr. Pasch, we have some viewers from Hessen, so from abroad. Could you maybe describe how the situation is different from what people in Hessen, for instance, know, what people are allowed to do in Belgium, what they are not allowed to do, uh, taking into account the fact that the has all measures have already been loosened and is little. So there are stronger restrictions in Belgium than most German states from the very start, because Belgium from the very start has a very strict uh, lockdown. So you needed a good and solid reason to leave your apartment or your house. You were allowed to go for walks, but with limitations. And otherwise, you could only go to work or for shopping or get medication. Otherwise, you had to stay at home. Companies were only allowed uh, to work in essential areas. All shops were closed, and ever since the four, now since the fourth May, measures have been eased a little. Where companies can take up work again, but once again with limitations and restrictions, and only st starting yesterday, uh, shops have been open again and the confinement to lockdown has been loosened a little you are now allowed to meet four people that do not live in your own home so that uh, fits well with mother's day uh, uh, so you give the possibility to visit people is, uh, is there a combination maybe and uh, what's the what experience have you made with this loosening of confinement lockdown. Well, for most people, these 
recovered freedoms are insufficient from their personal point of view. And I completely understand that because people compare this with the situation in uh, other countries and neighboring countries. They look at the situation in Germany, in Northern Westphalia, where there is you just have more freedom to do things and then in Belgium, which is of course linked to the different situation uh, in Germany and in Belgium. But so far we have not uh, been able to observe a negative aspect by, uh, from loosening the measures, but we have to be honest. And if we look at the numbers, we can, uh, we can only look back at what happened seven or 10 days ago. And we cannot say what impact opening shops yesterday will have on hospitals today. We have to wait for that. So maybe next Monday you can say this has worked, we can take the next steps or not. The Belgian uh, Security Council will take, will decide uh, uh, further easing of the measures tomorrow. There has been some exchange on that, but it's very, very, it'll be very limited because we cannot know the effect of the measures introduced yesterday. But as I said, the capacity in hospitals is currently very low. We have uh, more than 70% capacity in the ICU, intensive care units in all hospitals. So we have huge capacity reserves in order to absorb uh, an increased number of cases. Now, if you decide that tomorrow, if you said that tomorrow there will be further loosening, where, what will happen? So to the very beginning of the exit strategy, uh, a couple of phase, a number of phases was announced, started at the 4th of May, the first phase continued on the 11th, so yesterday, the second phase will start on the 18th of May, and then we will go for the third phase on the 8th of June for the second phase or third phase, we were looking into possibilities for sport, for outside activities, for example, some sport clubs may have the possibility to become active again, schools, so certain classes in schools will be opened again on the 18th of May, there will be new childcare options and possibilities, that will be possible, there are some other changes, but that I cannot mention yet. So a lot has happened that has been announced already. I have a very personal question once more. Can you give me hope that my children, third and fifth grade, can go back to school ahead of before September? I cannot answer that. Belgium has decided on a framework for schooling that at a maximum uh, allows three years, three grades per school part, so per six year half of the school system. So a certain number will be able to go back to school on Monday. And of course, the plan is to include more grades after, uh, if, the, if the numbers allow for it in the future. So you don't want to frustrate me, complete me. But uh, Mr. Pash, you've mentioned the neighboring countries. The situation is that there that there's a level of comparison going that for example that you can already go uh, sit outside of a bar maybe in neighboring countries so the, which also does touch to the question of closed bar of closed borders uh, because people in belgium are used to traveling across europe have people living on the uh, or friends or partners or family members in the neighboring countries and a question from claudia Manz is uh, if well, what's happened when the border controls between Germany and Belgium will stop? Well, first of all, I would like to say that at the beginning of the crisis, there were clo so close borders could be justified. The, the damage was different, uh, was at different levels in uh, the states, had to act locally, did it at different speeds, so it made a lot of sense. So I can understand why borders were closed at the beginning. Now the situation is uh, different today. Every member state has decided on a very strong lockdown. The epidemiological situation is in all our neighboring states comparable up to a certain degree. So we really should, uh, as quickly as possible, 
uh, be ready and available to open the borders to catch up to what we missed doing at the beginning. But we weren't prepared for this, so it made sense at the beginning. Uh, that we've lived through things that we couldn't imagine because it's basically cancelled out Schengen. And I wasn't able to imagine going to this type of life, and I uh, don't want to live in that way either. So, but now we have a comparable situation in neighboring states, so now we can get back to organized cooperation in Europe and take steps of the exit strategy together in a coordinated fashion, which of course includes open borders. And the National Security Council has decided uh, at the day of Jewish speaking community um, uh, on Wednesday that the borders are to be opened, that this list of uh, essential reasons to cross borders will have further reasons added on from the point of view from Belgium. Everything that is allowed in Belgium should be allowed to cross borders as well. This is, however, limited by two conditions. The epidemiological situation has to be comparable in the neighboring states. I believe that is the case, but it's something that has to be verified. And of course, the, na the neighboring state has to agree to that, because even if we allow Belgians to leave, the other country has to allow them in as well. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And if we have a good uh, analysis of the medical situation, and if the German Minister of the Interior, Mr. Seehofer, allows this, we could open the border. But this would mean that Mr. Seehofer has to give his OK. Either Mr. Seehofer confirms that we can do this from our Belgian side, or it would be enough to say uh, it's the different um, Bundesländer, the different regions in Germany, but the states communicate on a statal level, and therefore we need uh, a, either a direct permission or uh, a delegation. And uh, the states might consider the things differently from the regions that are on the border. And uh, we have a different examples. We have people who would like to open the borders. And we should add some of the reasons in order to uh, avoid uh, uh, some situations, because this is really problematic, closing down the borders. Uh, I've seen that people couldn't cross the border, even if it was necessary for their life. One week ago, a young lady, there are more of them now, and she explained to me uh, that her baby is getting uh, milk powder that is not available in Belgium. And as you can't go or cross the border uh, to buy a dead milk powder, uh, she had a problem. And now I have heard that her mom, who is living in uh, Germany, had a really bad car accident, and she is dying. This is something uh, that we have to consider at the uh, emotional level, uh, only think about Mother's Day. Uh, there are people really living uh, a couple of hundreds of meters on the other side of the border, and uh, they can't come together. Since weeks, uh, these are situations. There are people uh, that uh, somebody who wanted to, is allergic and wanted to buy a product in Luxembourg, and he was not allowed to do that. These are cases that we have in daily life because we close down uh, the borders. And therefore, I would like uh, in order to be really human, to get back to reality. This is very important. How optimistic are you uh, that we will have also a solution because the Commission will uh, present uh, uh, 
recommendation to all the member states. We all know the drafts that are already um, circulating and uh, the commission uh, first criticized, but then they, uh, well, at the end, nothing is happening. This is also the responsibility of the states to be European, to act European. You can't only blame the commission for everything we have seen, or I know what you are talking about. This is not avoiding uh, or blocking the situation I was talking about. This is uh, already something positive. And I would like to have some more pressure from the European level, but uh, this would not help to uh, go quicker. But hey, but I do know uh, we will have the opening of the borders. We will have a progressive opening. And as we decided in uh, uh, Belgium, that the situation has to be similar. And obviously, we have to get in contact with the neighbor state. These are points that we can guarantee. And therefore, I'm optimistic that we will have a quick solution uh, in order to open our borders. Uh, certainly, more pressure would be helpful. Like uh, all the people from North Rhine Westphalia might then come to have summer holidays uh, in Belgium. This is something really difficult and very uh, much discussed. A lot of people in my region uh, depend on the Horeca, which is hotel, restaurants, and catering, and uh, bistros, and uh, everything else. Uh, therefore, everybody who is depending on tourism is uh, obviously uh, suffering. Uh, we have families, companies they, that risk to fail. We have to give them a perspective, and we can't do that right now. Now We should anyhow also organize uh, help from the state, because one thing has to be clear. After this crisis, after all these measures, so we uh, must have our old life quality. This has economic and social aspects, and this is something that has to be prepared right now. And we can't allow people uh, to fail. And one perspective, the perspective is not clear because it depends, obviously, on the evolution of the different cases. And I can't confirm if we really can have tourism in summer. I'm wishing for it, but we, you never know. Mr. Pash, you were talking about the situation directly after the crisis, how the countries shut down, uh, looking how they could go ahead on their own, which is not the best way to go. Uh, we should know how to tackle a problem that is not only a national, but an international problem. And we have a question of Mr. Rudolf Kremer, who is asking, um, how is the development in between Belgium, Germany, and Italy, for France and Italy, for example? Uh, we have uh, some closures of the borders. And then, as far as the future is concerned, we should be careful. Uh, not to uh, question the existence of the European Union as itself. And if we, are, we, if we don't give solidarity, not only with Italy, also with others, with others uh, then these states will not uh, accept uh, the basis and all the rules of the European Union. And this might have a dramatic outcome. And therefore, in our country, and obviously also here being at Hesse, uh, to ask, as far as the Stability Pact is concerned, the form uh, uh, of how much money we can have, uh, this is something that we have to discuss. What is what does this mean in concrete? There have been signs of solidarity, sometimes uh, also with an exchange of uh, patients or exchanging uh, the masks. Uh, we had a package of uh, half a billion of euro that was given for help. 
what kind of solidarity do we need? Right now, we had uh, different approaches to give economic help, uh, possibility also to uh, have uh, personal protection, and the opportunity to use the, the cohesion fund and use those means uh, in order to be active in the corona crisis. Well, many already have taken this uh, opportunity, but I am talking about the mid term. In the stability pact, we can foresee that a lot of states will not be able to keep up with the stability factors and rules. Uh, then we uh, should also guarantee something uh, for them and have to guarantee that these states will have a huge uh, crisis uh, and we have to gu guarantee that there will be fees that they can then pay back to the bank. We uh, should talk about euro bonds if the alternative my, uh, that uh, the commission is, uh, thanks to the AAA, uh, getting or lending money from the banks. Uh, but um, we do need a lot of flexibility and mid-term solidarity with all of the states that have, have been hit the most. And uh, just to try a triple A rating, euro bonds, uh, all in the hands of uh, technicians, uh, the Italians, uh, French, uh, Spanish, uh, do not need any loans. They don't want to have further debts. They uh, want some money, they want help. And this should be organized by the states uh, like Sweden, Denmark, China, Germany, that have the opportunity, the possibility to do so. And the commission is trying to balancing how many things they can give. What would, where would you like uh, to see solidarity? Do we need a lot of money, a lot of solidarity? It seems clear to me that we have to find a way somewhere in the middle. It has, I had mentioned it earlier, it will be necessary to take on some debt to take credit because this will have to be necessary. I don't think we can avoid this, but it has to be allowed and it has to be possible in ex under acceptable conditions. And I'm also in favor clearly stated uh, that there need to be aids, uh, that there need to be different types of aids for the states uh, over several years in order to re-establish and stabilize the economic structure and base basis of these countries uh, to re-establish them afterwards. Because it doesn't help anyone if we have a European Union with a completely bankrupt Italy at the end. This doesn't help Germany either. Our uh, economic relations are so tightly knit with each other that it's in our, our very own interest that all our partner states become stabilized. If we don't do it, and I have uh, tried this earlier, people will not forgive us if we do not help. And that can only end badly. We've already seen that in Italy, especially looking at Germany, well, that there has been some skepticism with the uh, Italians looking at Germany to face it very carefully. But you also have almost uh, much or Flemish or German taxpayers that tend to be skeptical. This point. How do you explain to them that their money is going into other countries to help? Well, even the states uh, that you mentioned in Belgium have a strong interest that a country of the size of Italy has a stable economy. It's in our very own interest because our own economy is linked to their economy. And if we don't have any trade with them anymore, it'll, it would hurt our own economy very much as well. So it's our own interest in uh, not only from a political and economical situation, it's also a peace interest because the European Union is the greatest promise for peace. This is 
not just to preach uh, as an official on Sunday. You know, I'm from an area where we have lived through wars, where we have had bad experience from, from war and the time after the war. And, you know, we know how important the Union was for even to have a German speaking community of Belgium. And all of this would be risked if we do not show enough solidarity, if we do not help our neighbors. We have to ask ourselves what is too much resistance to this. So financing this over debt, over redistribution within the EU, what is your answer to this? So I am under the impression, and I regret this deeply, that Eurobonds or Corona bonds do not find unanimous acceptance in the European Union. So pragmatically, we have to find alternatives to this. So the way the Commission and the Member States are intending to take now, if I read this read correctly, is that the European Union and the Commission will uh, try to amplify and take over these credits and that the Member States can access these funds then. I'm not sure if this is a viable alternative, but I can see at least see a philosophy and uh, the idea that was behind the Eurobonds will still be applied with it, this idea of taking uh, over debt jointly. So what's the position of Belgium in all of this? Because we're always talking about the south, where France is included by now, and we're talking about the north, and Belgium has always been north and south at the same time. So what's Belgium's position on this? Well, we also have to survive a huge economic shock, so we're expecting a regression by minus 8% um, for 2020. This will have an impact, so uh, state debt in Belgium would uh, increase to a level of 115% of gross domestic product, which is a very high value, and we're also dependent on having a certain level of flexibility for our budget, because the European Union, for example, has to accept our budget planning, and of course, as far as the state debt criteria are concerned, and many European states are concerned by this, not only South European states, so Belgium itself would also profit from such a system. Well, people who profit from this, well, it means that Belgium would be given the opportunity to find its way out of the crisis. And economic aid is simply necessary in order to enable economists to rebound after the crisis, to, to rebuild. This requires that in bad times like these, investment has to be possible beyond the, st the stability pact. I am also responsible for the value of finance in my small community and we have to save in good times to be able to help in bad times. It must be possible to accept deficits and to take on debt in bad times and these and most certainly in the times we're living in now because these are most certainly bad times. To so stay with Belgium for a moment. So we have a government which is more of an emergency government that has mostly been formed in order to tackle the crisis. Uh, as far as interior policy is concerned, how do things develop there? Will we see a um, stable, real functioning government in autumn, or will we slip back into the classical political chaos of Belgium? Well, this on this is almost as difficult uh, as a prognosis for the crisis situation. I make that drag a little bit, but we are currently, we have an effective government that is able to act, that is confirmed, but at the end of June, as has been planned, we might uh, this might be put to the test again. Big question. I ex I think it's pro it's likely that this government will be renewed at that point uh, after the last election that happened a year ago in May. We have uh, uh, ongoing attempts to achieve a federal government and the leaders of different parties are taking position upon it, but how this will end up uh, at the current uh, moment in time, I can simply not give a prognosis on this, but beyond all linguistic conflicts that occasionally happen, in spite of all those, in most of the core questions linked to this corona crisis, we are cooperating, we're working together, 
uh, we have a uh, we have a conference of Hmong prime ministers uh, where we have from uh, from Flemish region, from the Flemish region, and the, and the prime minister, and they're all sitting um, at the table. We have not spoken once about uh, linguistic policy or about disagreements on this. Now, this is something special for Belgium. This has to be mentioned here for our viewers. Uh, occasionally, we have conflict uh, in our country. That's not a secret, of course, but uh, I'm under the impression that the cooperation of the federal in Belgium is working very well. Of course, everybody has their own interests that have to be expressed. But now, for example, us schools are concerned every community is responsible on their own. The federal state does not have any responsibility for this, but but they still had to agree together when schools will be closed, when skills will be reopened again. Theoretically, we could have done this on different dates because it's not in the federal state's uh, authority, but it would not have been current at all. So we have agreed together when to close schools, when and how to reopen them to have a coherent approach for the whole federal state. And I know that not every federally set up country is able to do it in the same way without, I don't want to sound arrogant, but we've managed this in Belgium, other federal states might have more difficulty with this. And the way we treat uh, the elderly and in care facilities, the communities have a lot of their own authority, but we've agreed on a common framework here as well. So what I want to say here is that with all uh, of the potential conflict that is always reported in the media, anything you can read upon this, what I can say, what I can clearly see, where I'm part of the con this conference of the meetings, we're all working pragmatically and working together. Uh, it could even have a positive effect. And I dream and I hope that this will have a positive effect in the long run, but I don't know if this will come. But uh, it's, of course, also important uh, that uh, these people are part of very different political parties and that they can get closer together. We're approaching the end. I have three questions here. It's not really possible to link them together because they're very different. I have a question through the hotline. Uh, someone asking not about the financial problems, but how you solve the humanitarian, the human problems. And so the measures that the National Security Council have decided and other member states have decided uh, have uh, important consequences. It's no longer possible except for uh except situations to meet members of your family there is uh, an increase in domestic violence there are difficulties in how people live together this has a strong psychological impact and uh, we have to take this seriously which is why i said uh, a while ago already that uh, even if we understand the necessity of those limitations we have to offer people a perspective we have to help people but we have to understand we cannot risk that our efforts that the Belgian uh, population has taken up for the last seven weeks, that all of this becomes undone by loosening measures too quickly. And because, it, because if we have an exponential increase uh, in uh, of occupied hospital beds, then we would be in a situation comparable to Italy again, and then people would not be able to be admitted to the hospital independently of if they have COVID or not, because, because you can go to hospitals for other reasons. So that would uh, all be for naught, uh, all the success we've had with our seven weeks of effort, so we cannot lose these successes. So we didn't talk yet about the second wave of cases that might then be uh, lead even to a new lockdown. But this is something uh, that is very near and very far at the same time. Concretely, Julia Wiekel is asked in the quarantine, uh, do we still have quarantine uh, when we are coming from Germany to Belgium? And this 
is also uh, obviously uh, connected to uh, people working, we should uh, differentiate. Uh, generally, who is coming from Germany to Belgium or vice versa, we have this quarantine of 40 days, two weeks, but there are a lot of exceptions on both sides uh, of uh, the border. If you uh, living near to the border, uh, working in Belgium and uh, living in Germany or vice versa, if you have a partner that is living on the other side, uh, then you don't have a quarantine. And uh, especially also for questions, uh, if you want to go uh, to a funeral, to the doctor or participate in a marriage, all these are important points that we uh, accorded in between. Uh, Belgium and some of the German regions, and in this case we do not have quarantine, in other cases we do have quarantine. And I would like to add several things like uh, visiting uh, family members or um, being able to, to buy something in the neighbor country, and we in Belgium, we ask people to buy things really in their country. But very often, if you are on the border, then the uh, shop on the other side of the border is nearer. And uh, why should you have 20 or 30 kilometers to run with a car? Uh, in this case, it's useful that uh, you go to the other shop. If you are uh, talking about a family, uh, people that are working, that, that, that are living uh, just next to the border, we can't allow people to travel. And as people in Belgium, we can't allow more than what we are allowing people in our country. We have to be careful because otherwise this would be fair and uh, therefore I'm opening the borders with all the things I've already uh, told you and uh, obviously then going ahead step by step. Now I have a question, uh, and uh, this is a difficult name, Orsolia Feldeschi. I would like to know which kind of the industry is hit, particularly in Belgium, where you need uh, more help from the government. Uh, uh, Brussels Airlines would like to um, fire 1,000 people uh, out of 4,000. We already talked about tourism. Now we have the problems everywhere. We had um, a study in the whole country, and uh, we see that at the end, no part uh, of uh, economy or uh, third sector, uh, everybody is hit by the crisis. Uh, I already said that uh, related to tourism, and probably tourism will suffer more because we still don't have a perspective for them, and they can restart since yesterday, uh, like the shops, but the restaurants, the hotels, for the bars, they don't have anything. Uh, they don't earn anything, but they have to pay. And uh, those who might have an advantage are not there. No, obviously. Uh, food uh, was uh, obviously winning more because it was the only thing you were allowed to, to buy in the last few weeks. Uh, and then we also have the butchers with their rules, but uh, for the rest, everybody is suffering. And I do have a question, uh, Mr. Buchmüller, the high death toll in uh, Brussels, it's a statistic question. 
Yes, so that's a statistic question. Therefore, uh, I ask everybody to uh, go into detail because uh, there you can also understand the problem. All the deaths in the hospitals or uh, in homes for seniors are considered, and all those uh, uh, who died in the hospital might or should be tested. But in the homes for elderly people, not everybody has been tested. And if you put the two numbers together and you see that from the 8,700, only the half, half of this uh, data is relating to people who died because of COVID. And when can we have tests for almost everybody? We have already heard that there are more and more tests, but uh, uh, there are people that have symptoms but are not able to have a test. The federal government, uh, uh, we had, during the last few days, we had 15 to 20,000 tests. If you uh, related to the number of inhabitants of Belgium, then we are really leading in Germany. And, uh, we are even trying to go to 45,000, uh, but I guess if we compare this to Germany, it's similar. Thank you very much for uh, this exchange, I guess, uh, uh, our German and uh, Belgian um, guests uh, uh, were very interested. Uh, we have uh, Sig Grammaticus Buchfink, uh, a library in Brussels. And I do not know what she will be reading, but it is a reading for children. And uh, uh, on Thursday at one o'clock, we have Michael Kraus uh, here from the German Embassy. And obviously, we will talk about financing, solidarity, and death. And now I ask you to grab your coffee, your tea, or if you don't want coffee or tea, uh, uh, whatever you want. And uh, please come back on the 70s. Thank you very much.